Hey everyone, Janice here with my latest video. Today I'd like to talk about penis health and growth indicators. Just to make things a bit easier, I've decided to divide it into two lists, and the first one I'm going to be going over is the penis health one. The first thing on this list that I'd like to talk about is blood flow. In the PE world, there's a common misbelief that you can be a grower or a shower. These are misnomers. The reality is you either have good blood flow or you don't. Growers categorically have far less developed arteries than a shower and poorer vascular health overall. And I can say this because I've personally made the transition from grower to shower. As my arteries became more developed and I cleaned up my diet, I completely stopped getting shrunken flaccids, cold flaccids, or discoloration from inadequate blood flow. Now, my member is in a near constantly healthy pink and heavy hanging state. So what exactly does this mean? Basically, if you find yourself being a grower, it's time to start hitting that treadmill, going for that run, or picking up a physically demanding hobby. Beyond that, if you want to start gaining size below the belt, it's time to start taking a critical and honest look at your diet. More than likely, there are elements present that are hard in your health. If you'd like to know what some of these elements might be, I've included a video suggestion at the end of this video. Furthermore, you should consider your grower state to be the canary on the floor of the mind, so to speak. The state of your sexual organs is a powerful outward indicator of your cardiovascular health, or lack thereof. The male sexual organ is basically a giant capillary bed. The vast majority of your cardiovascular system is also comprised of capillary beds. This means that any food, habit, or substance that is killing your erections is also doing just as much damage to your other organs. So do yourself a favor and get your sexual prowess back. Now for the kicker. I'd say that 90 plus percent of the problems that guys are going to have relating to PE and overall performance is related directly to blood flow. However, if you're able to get this aspect taken care of, then that leads to number two. Number two, eating to maintain. It should be no surprise to anyone that's experimented with bodybuilding that eating to maintain is crucial to fighting off muscle loss. Your penis is no different. By keeping your calories and protein at optimal levels, so long as they aren't from, say, risky food sources, you should notice a marked improvement in the overall feel and responsiveness of your member if you've been under eating or eating a lot of empty calories from junk food. Personally, anytime my calories and protein levels dipped, my erectile health tanked right along with the rest of my body. There's no way around it. The forces that maintain are also the very same forces that grow, and I will cover that in the growth indicators portion of the video. Number three. Avoiding constrictive clothing. I don't care how cool skinny jeans may look, they are suffocating your sex organs. In all seriousness. Avoid tight clothing at all costs on the lower body. It's completely unnatural and it can lead to all manner of injuries and deformations that can make sex both difficult and painful. Furthermore, it severely hampers your blood flow. Worse still, tight-fitting clothing is more than likely doing zero favors for your testosterone levels. Do yourself a favor, donate your tight-fitting clothing, buy some boxers, and if possible, wear clothing that breathes. The last part can do double to stave off things like fungal infections if you still haven't managed to get your blood flow problems under control. Areas of the body that have impaired blood flow are more susceptible to things like infections, chronic injury, and of course fungal infections. Having a sweaty pelvic area along with little to no airflow combined with poor circulation is a problem waiting to happen. Number four. Avoid anti-inflammatory lubricants, lotions, or any topicals for that matter. Outside of a doctor telling you that you need to use them, don't. The fastest way to both shrink and, yes I said shrink, and reduce the health of your member is using anti-inflammatory substances. Out of control inflammation does no one any favors, but low to moderate levels are still needed for things like tissue growth and maintenance. Blunting inflammation for the sake of it is a really quick way to end up with chronic injuries, a shrunken size, and significantly impaired erectile quality. Number five, 
drug side effects. Doctors are not omnipotent, and drug companies care about profits. It's never, let me repeat that, never a good idea to put something in your body that you don't know a good deal about. Most drug companies have small booklets written on their drugs. Yes, small booklets. If you are taking any medication, find those booklets and do some reading. Staying informed keeps you from being blindsided by debilitating side effects or potentially irreversible damage later on down the line. Even seemingly innocuous medications found over-the-counter can have debilitating side effects that can rob you blind of your prowess in the bedroom. Number six, keeping an eye on your shut-eye. We all know that poor sleep can ruin just about the start of any day, but it can also have long-term implications. Poor sleep and cardiovascular distress are intimately related. More than a few studies have shown that those who suffer from poor sleep have an increased risk for cardiovascular disease along with an uptick in all-cause mortality. Personally, even a few days of bad sleep can just about kill any chances I have of maintaining blood flow. It's miserable. If you're someone that suffers from sleep issues, it could save your romantic relationship and life to get them fixed. But that's something that most everyone already knows. What a lot may not know is that it's how you sleep that can also have a huge effect on size gains. Based on my own observations and research notes, I found that side sleepers have significantly fewer complications with impaired blood flow and report a higher likelihood of waking up with morning erections. Now, going even further, sleeping with a pillow between your legs seems to improve the likelihood of waking up with morning erections even more. Number seven, masturbation. Now, this is a deceptive problem and half-hearted solution all in one. For years now, guys have reported masturbation can reduce their number of erections along with their potency. Most of these woes go back to the biochemical storm orgasm produces, which can lead to a reduction in both dopamine and testosterone receptors in the brain and also cause a rise in prolactin that can stick around for quite some time. However, this isn't something I would wholeheartedly tell a guy to stop doing without replacing it with something else. I find that a lot of men abuse masturbation because at one point in time it was the only way a male could keep blood flow to his sexual organs high. Telling a guy to flat out stop masturbating could have the unintended side effects of a reduction in size and functionality of their member due to tissue starvation. This reason is one of the contributing factors that led me to create the Angia methods. By using the Angia method techniques, a male no longer needs to sacrifice his erectile health while going through some of the darker and more disconcerting stages of withdrawal seen during reboot from porn. Number eight, and this one can be tricky, environmental factors. If you suffer from poor erectile or cardiovascular health and you've already addressed one through seven of this list, the next area I would suggest looking at would be your environment itself. Our world is fraught with toxins of various parts per million and billion. While the vast majority of substances need to be consumed for their effects to really mount, some of the more deadlier varieties can already start dealing damage to our organs by simply breathing them. Others can absorb through our skin and cause all manner of internal damage. Whether it be your home, social, or work life, always be mindful of environmental factors. Some of the most egregious offenders can be artificial scenting agents, mold, automotive fumes, heavy metals, and contaminated water. If you live in a city, it's a good idea to get a top-of-the-line filtration unit for your home and for the love of God, avoid water softening agents. These are usually full of salt. Secondhand smoke is also another really, really big one and cleaning agents to name just one more. Any of these sources can absolutely wreck your overall health, but they are so often overlooked. Now that I've covered some of the various sources of erectile problems I've come across, I'd like to switch gears and talk about signs of growth. 
As can be expected, number one is improved blood flow. The number one goal of any PE fitness endeavor should be an increase in blood flow before anything else. Without improved blood flow, growth simply cannot happen. So the quickest way to judge whether or not a workout or diet plan is working out is how it affects your blood flow. This number one reason holds out both in the short and long term. The quickest way to get growth on track is to make sure your workouts result in a well-plumped member and that the state persists for a while thereafter. Anytime I use any of the NGEM methods or the various exercises I've talked about on my channel, they all result in amazing muscle pumps when used properly. This means not doing too many sets or reps, going too long, or using excessive force. A lot of traditional PE can also cause a plumped member. However, these are almost always the result of things like excessive soft tissue trauma, edema, or fluid collection due to their method of implementation. These are not desirable or healthy. Edema and fluid collection is not a muscle pump. The difference will be in how they look. Whenever your member is experiencing a muscle pump, it will still possess its overall shape. Furthermore, it will have very prominent veins, along with a vibrant pinking but not reddened, a large overall feel in your hand, and you may actually experience a temporary loss in length as your capillary beds really open up and flush your member with blood. Basically, you will experience temporary gains akin to the differences between cold measurements versus warmed measurements like we would find in skeletal muscle. A part of this process is that you should notice an increase in pulse strength. After a session of using any of my methods, it's a good sign to notice if you have a more prominent pulse. Now, the way that you can check this is by locating the arteries on either side of the dorsal vein that runs along the top side of your member. By depressing the area either to the left or the right, you should be able to notice a heartbeat. Now, if you have underdeveloped arteries, it may be difficult to find your pulse at first. Now, if you do have underdeveloped arteries, number two is some pretty good news. Number two, increased vascularity. Bigger masses of muscle need bigger masses of vascular tissue to support them. Blood vessels grow before anything else. So, if you notice an increase in vascularity with a given plan, this is a powerful sign that you're on the right track. Conversely, if you notice discoloration of your blood vessels, odd distensions, or pallor to your skin, these are bad signs. Anytime your blood flow drops off, this is a powerful indicator of both overtraining and vascular trauma. Regardless of the case, it would be unwise to continue with any plan that causes these outcomes. In some instances, it may be doing too much of a given plan or too many sets of a given exercise. On the other hand, it may be the exercise itself or potentially its implementation. Now, I've been quite vocal on this matter before and I will mention it again. Pressure-based exercises can be very dangerous to vascular tissue as it can result in significant drops in localized nitric oxide production which can cause undesirable phenotype switching as a consequence. Number three, going from a grower to a shower. Much like I said at the start of this video, grower and shower are misnomers. A grower is a man with poor blood flow and a shower is a man with good blood flow. So should things be on track, a male should expect to become a shower as his blood vessels develop. Now ideally, by this time, a male may have already started to notice an increase in size. Similar to what we find with bodybuilding, changes in size will show up temporarily before they become cemented. This refers to beginning and post-exercise measurement differences. This means that keeping an eye on muscle pumps is a really good idea. Anything that shows up there usually has a high likelihood of becoming cemented in time so long as calorie and protein intake stays optimal. In this aspect, it comes from capillary bed activation. Since the male member is essentially a giant capillary bed, any sudden changes in size during a workout come via increased capillary bed perfusion and smooth muscle relaxation, at least in regard to my exercises. 
This does not apply to things like fluid buildup, which is common with traditional PE. Okay, so something many might not know is that the differences between stretched flaccid length and erect length comes down to changes in dimension and also smooth muscle activation. Typically, whenever we stretch our member out, this causes it to thin a bit, which frees up just that much little extra of our longitudinal collagen wrappings. Conversely, this is why a very plumped member can actually measure shorter temporarily. However, there is a hidden aspect to this dynamic. In my studies of blood vessels, I came across what is known as a non-contractile transitionary phenotype switch stage. This means smooth muscles may be actively switching either to or from a synthetic phenotype, and this is outwardly expressed as a blunted response to nitric oxide. Smooth muscles are very strong little cells. Pound for pound, they are anywhere from two to three times stronger than skeletal muscle. This can lead to a great deal of resistance while in a contracted state. This can contribute to gaps in bone-pressed flaccid length versus bone-pressed erect length. What further solidifies this point is that by increasing intracavernosal pressure using squeezed base exercise methods, these gaps can be temporarily reduced or completely eliminated. However, as pressures normalize, the gap returns. This is why pressure-based PE exercises hold a great deal of interest in the PE community, despite the seemingly unavoidable trauma to endothelial cells. Number four, and perhaps the most obvious, is size changes. So long as one through three have occurred and food intake is optimal, size differences should be measurable. Now, unlike the first three instances of growth indicators, this one was once a big problem. In PE circles, it's common for men to cite something called newbie gains and then a sudden drop off in gaining. Based on my own research and the effects of traditional forms of PE, I strongly suspect that this stems from tissue trauma, underdeveloped arteries, and ineffective exercise regimens. Being completely serious, PE works on nearly the exact same lines as bodybuilding in terms of its principles. This means that so long as food intake is on par, hormones are up, and blood flow is high, gains should continue until it runs into the limitations of either of the three. In this case, food will be less of a contributing factor, but it's no excuse to undereat. The vast majority of the problems will come from blood flow and hormones, both of which can be addressed with cardiovascular training. Number five, increased sensitivity. Now, while this can occur at nearly any stage, increased sensitivity is most notable when growth is apparent. Based on my own observations and the comments of other men, improved sensitivity and gaining tend to be fairly synonymous. This more than likely stems from the fact that blood vessel and nerve growth are caused by a similar set of bioactive growth factors, which are upregulated anytime blood vessels are stimulated. Speaking personally, before I created the NGM method series, I had a pretty deplorable lack of sensation in my sexual organs from my various failed experiments. Once I had completely given up on my aspirations of a larger size and shifted my focus to improving the health of my member, it was only then that things started really falling into place and I started gaining size again. In my early days of experimentation and creating the NGM methods, I came to rely quite heavily on improved sensation as a way to outwardly gauge growth factor release. Now, while this was a fairly limited tool, it played an enormous role in reshaping my personal philosophy and outlook regarding sexual organ-based exercising. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this video because I had a lot of fun making it. As always, I'm your host, Janice, signing off.